<laughs> Grace is helping me. You're going to have to do something right there. Is that spotlight view for everybody? Yeah. Okay. Unmute him. Mute. And am I unmuted? No. Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Tracia, I'm going to have to have you come back and do the spotlight view once. Not yet, but I want to see everybody just while we're while we're doing this. Um, thanks, Chris, for helping us. Uh, can't hear you yet. Let's see. Can you? There we go. There's Chris. Um, so this happened because uh, as mom, Grammy said, let's get a call together. And a few of us did two weeks ago. And then I said, well, we've been having these Zoom calls for our church, for our work. We have something that's called important conversations. And we've been different groups at um, 7400 Woodlawn, which is in the Green Lake area of Seattle. And before we were all quarantined to stay home, we had a couple of speakers come in. One that was talking about fair trade and cooperative um, farming. And then we had a science of gender um, speaker. And now Chris is gonna in, in cooking and we are just continuing to think about what kind of conversations we as communities want and need to be having. And so we also had a poet come in and share um, a couple of poetry classes and got us writing uh, poetry while we were stuck at home. And so it was, that was great as well. And so Chris is joining us from Kansas City and I'll let him explain more about where he is and, and what his work is. But I, I know that we've, as family, have heard some of what uh, his work and business has, had been doing in terms of philanthropic kind of stuff even before the coronavirus hit. And then we learned how busy he's been in making sure that everybody's getting good Kansas City barbecue in the midst of all of this. So um, I'm going to turn it over to him. He said he's got he's got opportunity if anybody is wanting to be cooking along with him that he'll go slow enough that that you can be doing stuff. Tracy and Caden and if if not you can be watching this again and and cook as you go so take notes but if you have questions you can Ask him of ask him those questions too. So thanks, Chris. Great to have you. Hi everyone. Um, I hope everybody can hear me all right. Uh, kitchens are invariably very loud, so I will not be able to hear you. Angela, if you can turn the phone around and say hello. Hi. Angela is my apprentice. He will be listening to you. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate to speak up. I will not be able to hear you, but she will translate for me. Um, so a couple of things about us um, and what we're doing during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, uh, I work for Jack Stack Barbecue. Fiorella's uh, is our event space. And uh, so catering has been hit the hardest by this pandemic. So everywhere around the country, if anything over 50 people, or 10 people now, wherever, depending on where you are, are canceled and or um, postponed. So really within the first 10 days of this, we lost just under a million dollars worth of business um, for just through um, June. And so what we're doing is we switched over and we took our big kitchen here and we turned it into a commissary kitchen for all the restaurants and uh, we decided so we send out everything from here every day everything from carrot cake cupcakes cookies um, all their dressings all of their beans all their corn and we do that all here today was actually the last day we're doing that because we are switching a few gears too and we're going to start doing carry out and delivery out of so um, why I'm here today is to show you guys how to cook a couple of very simple dishes, but very, uh, very hearty, simple, and something that anybody can do really. It's really the, one of my favorites is the uh, authentic Southern Greens. And uh, so I'm gonna get started on that. Um, and I'll also start talking about a little bit of the philanthropy 
be the Jack Stack, and Fiorella's Jack Stack does for the community while we're in this. Um, so the Southern Greens, you want to start off by washing your greens. I've washed them all. So this here, we have collard greens, and then we have some turnip greens. You can have the turnip greens and the mustard greens. Give it a little bit of a kick where they're a little bit spicier. I like mustard, but they only had turnip and collard at the store today. So turnip greens are a little spicier than collards. Collards are very hearty. That's where you get the real body from. And so once you wash them, you take, and what you're gonna do is you just wanna peel that center rib out because that will stay tough throughout. So I just want to keep peeling these out, and I'm going to have Angela actually set the phone down now that she's seen this part, and we're going to peel these together, and then I'm just going to talk for a little bit. So same with the same with the uh, turnip greens. You just want to peel that here. You just want to peel that center rib out. And so some of the things that we've been doing with uh, charities is we have a big uh, group of uh, businessmen here in Kansas City got together, actually two of them, and I can only remember one of their names, BJ Kissel is one of them. Um, they got together and they actually put in a bunch of money and matched a whole bunch of, uh, what do they call that thing? They to ask for money on Facebook or YouTube. But so they, they went on and asked for donations and uh, in the first week they got $50,000 in donations and what we do is we take that money and we discount box lunches and so we send out box lunches uh, to all of the first responders and to the hospitals in Kansas City. So far uh, to date we've done about 12,000 box lunches and we are getting ready to do a first responders lunch um, in about two weeks for 2,500 um, firefighters and policemen in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, so that's one of the ways that we are trying to help. The other ways we are helping is we have actually gone from about 25% of our staff um, to where now we are at 75% of staff. Um, so our owners, we did so well with carry out at our five restaurants. Um, in the first three weeks, we hit our first million dollar mark. And uh, so we, the, the owners and um, all the senior leaders and myself decided to put everybody to get as many people back to work as we possibly could. Hold on, I'm getting the call. So sorry, I'm trying to get this right. Okay, can you guys hear me? I just see myself, so I don't know that that's a good thing. Yeah, we can hear you, Chris. Okay, good. I'm just looking at myself on both little screens, so where are you, me? So we put 75% of our workforce back to work. Um, that means uh, 30 hours a week for everybody. And um, we split our teams up into two different teams. We have, we at Catering and TRL decided we didn't like A and B because that B team sounds a little not very good. So we went with Aliens and Predators. We are actually the predators on this team, on the weekend team, because they're killing it. Uh, so we um, split our teams up so if any one of us got sick on one of the teams, we could split off the other team and uh, and not shut down. So in a lot of operations, if somebody gets sick, you have to shut down the entire operation. We would just shut down for a half a day, and then we would uh, open back up after we sanitized and cleaned everything. So once you get your greens to here, I'm going to go ahead and let Angela finish those up. Then you can take an onion. So we have large onions here. 
know, just one large onion or two small ones is fine. Show you a little bit about. Let's see if it's going to keep this thing into. So I'm going to show the food a little bit instead of me. Oh, or not. So when you're dicing an onion, you want to be really careful when you're cutting into it like this. But I start by making one cut in. And you leave the butt end on, if you can see that, you leave the butt end on when you cut it in half, cut that top part off, and then you cut, make cut marks down, not cutting all the way through the butt. And then you cut against it, and you have a nice perfect dice. You want to turn on that pot right there, and then you can so Angela's gonna video a little bit and she if you guys you guys have any questions right now, she's gonna listen real quick. Comments are good. So, um, trying to think, well, Angela, do you have anything to add to what I just said? <laughs> nope. No. Nope. I think you said it all. <laughs> so, Angela is actually an apprentice. She goes to school at Johnson County Community College here for culinary arts. Uh, your first year, right? Yes. Yeah, so she's a first year apprentice. And so, I am an apprentice chef. I have been for years. Um, before we moved into this space back in September, we, uh, so now I'm going to cut the bacon just into some one inch pieces. Back in September, before we moved in here, I really couldn't have um, apprentices just because it was just barbecue that we were doing and it wasn't a lot of cooking techniques. But since we moved in here, we do a lot more than barbecue. And so Angela is our first apprentice. I think moving into the summer and probably in the fall, we'll have one or two more come on board. So now I'm just going to put bacon. with the onion. And we're gonna do, we're just gonna let the bacon saute and render and get those onions nice and translucent. So saute them just, just till they're translucent until the bacon's rendered and you have that nice grease in the bottom. So now you just want to take your greens and you can have a, I just, I just like to stack them up in maybe two or three stacks. You don't have to have perfect pieces. You just want to cut through them and make little squares out of them. If you cook the whole thing, it kind of tends to get stringy. So you just want to run your knife through a couple times that way. Angela or Chris, we've got a couple, yep, yes. we've got a couple questions. Okay. One, one is, do you, do you use a specific kind of bacon, brand of bacon? Do you use a specific kind of bacon? I just like to cut bacon. Uh, it doesn't have to be. We just use a hardwood smoked thick cut bacon. It's really special. There's nothing really special about it. it. We use one that is called, the brand is Daly's, but it's, it's just a nicer center cut bacon so you have a little less fat. But any big cut bacon will work. You got a thanks from Tony. You got a thanks from Tony. Sweet. And then we and then we want then we have a request to hear about how how do you uh, how do you hire your chefs? How do I hire my chefs? Do you have any specific? <laughs> like Angela, <laughs> we actually you know we have a. Um, we've probably, so we've probably hired the cooks that we've hired here in the last year and a half. We went from a year and a half ago having 
four cooks in the kitchen. Now our staff is right around 30. So we did a lot of hiring. So this is, this is especially trying for us when it comes to the this COVID thing is because our staff went from really very little to huge and we were doing huge events. Uh-oh, now that's gonna be so I have to plug it in at some point. But um so we were doing huge events and then it just stopped nothing. And so now we're at a place where we have to do a lot of different things. So we're looking and the hiring process for cooks, I don't necessarily look for um, that much experience. I'd rather have people that just have a lot of hope. You know, when we talk about hope at next bag, we have uh, humble, optimistic, passionate, and engaged. So those, that's what hope means to us. And so if I can get some very humble people who are willing to listen and willing to learn, that are engaged and hungry and really optimistic about what the future holds, then and passionate about what they do, because I am super passionate and listen to that. Sometimes a little bit overboard. Uh, very excited. Uh, we just, we, the hiring process is very uh, stringent. We go through a lot of, uh, the human resource process, but then we also go through a lot of the whole process, just making sure that people are the right fit, that this is going to be the right fit. And you know, a lot of times we end up pushing people in different areas of catering if we know that they're going to, if we know that they're going to be a fit or not. And uh, so if we know that it's somebody we want to hire, we get them in here regardless of whether we have a position. Their area, we just want to get them in here and get them. In get that hopeful person in here. So now you can tell that the uh, my phone is dying. That's why Angela's walking around kind of weird, but it's all good. Um, we're getting it plugged in. Scott over here, you can, Scott's our director of sales. Um, so he and I work on the Predator team together. We're two of the managers here. We have uh, Mary Angela, who is the operations manager who comes in as well and she runs all the bands and runs all of our, so we have all of our caterers now currently, since they're not delivering catering all the time, they do some box lunches, but they are actually uh, delivering um, carry out from the restaurant. So we station two bands at every one of the five restaurants and they deliver carry out now. As well as we have DoorDash and then we have curbside pickup. So this is about where you want the green, the onions to be, they're getting translucent, they're getting a little bit, you know, where you can see through them. And the bacon's getting a little bit rendered. You're not really looking for crisp bacon, you just want it to render down. We're gonna go about two more minutes and we're gonna put our greens in. So now we're gonna get started on the, uh, I'm actually going to finish the short ribs that are in the oven that have been in the oven. So the one thing that you want to make, so when you're doing your potatoes for the short rib, you want to put them in there for the last 45 minutes to an hour. I just like big chunks of potatoes. I don't, I'm not really concerned about how, what size they are, but as long as they're all uniform. So we're just going to do some roasted potatoes in with these short ribs that have been in the oven since about one o'clock. Our time, so they've been in what, almost three hours. And they're, they're probably really getting really close. I put them in there about 325. Um, and I just, so we have convection ovens, but I just use a low fan. So it's kind of a regular oven. I'm gonna pull these out. Okay, so we're gonna pull these out. Unwrap them. So then I'm gonna show you, now that I'm gonna put the potatoes in so you can see how they roast once they're done. So these, these short ribs are just about done. I'm gonna grab a plate of phone. I'm just gonna flip them over so we get that, get the caramelization underneath and we keep that moisture on them. But so this is the beef stock and it's been literally rendering down for the past three hours. That noise is not a truck backing up into our facility. That is our, uh, one of our big ovens that we cook all of our beans in. Okay, 
We have we actually have a taste thing tomorrow, and I'm gonna have some some of our cool pieces of equipment that we put in here. So when we get to right up there, right in there, we got some darkness. That's fine because we're gonna we're gonna put our greens in there, and then we're gonna pour our beer. In. I'm just going to put all the greens right on top of the bacon and onions. And our local store across the street under renovation. We did not have a ham hock like I said, optional, but we have a piece of ham. So what the ham hock would do if we were going to put it in there, it's actually the bone of the ham that gives the uh, give the stock and the, the liquid in this the body. So it'll give it the bone in that ham hock. We'll give it a nice, um, I a little thinner about but it's all like it's on top. We're gonna let that cook down, and you can just handle it if you just want to stir those. Yep. Stir them a little bit while I'm talking. So now I'm just gonna take these potatoes. Four or five potatoes that I cut up, and I'm just going to put them right on top of the meat. And then we're just going to roast them just like that. I'm going to put a little bit of salt in that water. So once you get it to the short ribs to this point, we'll, you'll see the first part of it. We've got the raw ones over here. We're going to start from scratch on that. But once you get it to this point, you will. Um, are going to want to leave it uncovered because that will roast these potatoes. And we're just going to go right back into the oven. So, how long are we going to cook those in our own ovens, not yours? You're going to cook it in your own oven right about three to four hours. And really, it's not a there's there's not an exact time for braised pieces of meat. It's just it's really a feel. So you're going to see when we take them out of the oven, when we're done with the segment, at the ends, you're going to see I'm going to put it on the cutting board and it's really a pork feel. When it's pork done is when it's done. They'll take between three and four hours. And then that last hour you want to have the potatoes in there so they just roast and brown so they don't over. So now we're going to take our beer. And we've got our Kansas City's own Boulevard, KC Pilsner. <laughs> so what this is going to do is this is what you call it. It's called deglazing. So what we're doing is we're getting all that bond, all that stuff on the bottom of the pan. And we're just, we want to get that beer so you get that really good color. You know that nice, see that color of the beer now? It's got, you get all that, it's called bond, the stuff that, sticks to the bottom of the pan is called F-O-N-D. And that's the that is the yummy bits. So that's what gives it the it gives it the nice give the greens the nice color that it does and it also gives it a lot of flavor. So I'm just gonna let that beer reduce just a little bit to cook off any alcohol in it. Okay, if you don't cook the alcohol up get that alcohol flavor it's not real appealing. As long as you cook these, really though, it's not, it wouldn't hurt if you just put the stock in there. Uh, I'm gonna look at my piece of paper because I don't want to miss any greens. Well, I've got chopped garlic here. Um, we chop, we chop five pounds of garlic at a time. So um, they, I think it's four cloves of peeled garlic. You're just gonna want to chop that up real fine. And put it into your uh, into the greens right here. So, uh, and if you're using chopped garlic and oil, chopped garlic and water, that's fine. You're think you're looking at right about a tablespoon of garlic. So now I'm going to go ahead and put the chicken stock in there. And I said. Two quarts on there, you really just want to cover everything. You want to go about two inches above it once you cover everything. So I've got just about two and a half quarts here, and that's about where you want. You just want to cover everything 
and then go above because this is gonna this is gonna cook for approximately two two and a half hours. Greens take a long time to break down, um, and so that's why you cook them so long. But we're gonna bring this to a boil. We're gonna add the rest of our ingredients, and then we're just gonna let it simmer. We're gonna bring it to a boil quickly, and then we're gonna turn it way down, and we're gonna leave it uncovered and just let it simmer for the next two hours. So we have uh, one tablespoon of paprika. So I've got um, smoked paprika here. A regular paprika is fine. And the center of my hand is exactly one tablespoon, if you're wondering. Uh, Worcestershire sauce. One tablespoon of cider vinegar. Vinegar really just gives everything a clean finish. Kind of like if you put lemon juice in something, it just gives it a really nice clean finish. Okay? It helps even out all the flavors. And then we're going to put it in into a hot tub, or more or less to how you how hot you like. Like my little hot. You can use any hot sauce that you like. You can if you have the habanero sauce in your in your cupboard that you want to use, that's perfectly fine. And then we're gonna put uh, and some freshly ground black pepper. So I we always taste everything. So I'm gonna taste it after I get the pepper in. We keep boxes of the plastic spoons for tasting. So you always want to taste things for seasoning before you add too much salt because the chicken stock we have has some sodium in it. Um, the bacon definitely has some sodium. All, all these, you know, the work this year, everything has some salt. And so you want it before you season too much, you want to taste it. And then as it cooks, we'll season it as well. I, I probably know, you know, 12, 15 grinds of a good pepper grinder. Then we're just going to stir it. It's almost to a boil. It's good, huh? Yeah. Very simple. I mean, with the ingredients that are in there, if you guys are cooking along, give it a taste. It just, and as that, as that cooks, those greens are going to soften up. And it's going to have, you're going to, it's going to be, for whatever the reason, the greens leaks out some, the ham hot will add some body to it, but it's going to be a really hearty soup. The, the stock on it is what makes the greens so good. Um, I should, I probably should have made these two days ago for Cassie's 21st birthday, 24th birthday, and she's just a her favorite um, dish in the world. But I waited two days after, so hopefully she can watch along. And uh, we can get, she can make them with these. So I'm going to cut up a little bit. We're going to move on to the spoon. Any questions? Chris, I think people would like to hear a little bit about both Jack Stacks and Fiorella's tell you a little bit about what the difference yeah what they what they are and how how does that work for you how how, how, did, did, how, what? how did fiorella's come to be and tell us about jack stacks yeah so jack stack. that, that, that's an interesting story it's one that you know goes way back so russ russ fiorella founded this back in 1959 57 uh jack stack fiorella jack stack barbecue actually Back then, it was called Smokestack. They had one restaurant off the highway, and uh, they, he and his wife lived above the restaurant, and they sold barbecue out of the storefront. Um, and so, in 1974, Jack Fiorella uh, broke off from the rest of them, and uh, Jack is Casey's, Case Norman 
father-in-law, Kate Norman, is the president and the owner of the company now. Or the, he was the president. He's the owner, CEO of the company. And so when Jack uh, moved away from the smokestack, they, his mother said everybody can use the Jack stack name for one thing. Um, if they want to, if they so choose. And so Jack really wanted to bring um, fine service to a barbecue restaurant. Because traditionally, a barbecue restaurant is a storefront where you walk up, you place your order, and you get your order. Um, so um, he wanted there to be more service. He wanted there to be nicer food. He wanted seafood. He wanted different things. He wanted, you know, what we call remarkable now. So he really wanted to take the service to a next level, and that's what he did with the first um, gas factory in Martin City, which is where we moved from. The catering department moved from. They were just a block away from the restaurant, the original restaurant. Um, and so in 1974, they opened the first gas factory in Martin City. And uh, since then, they've opened four more in Kansas City. Um, there's uh, Oakland Park was the second one. Uh, then there was the Plaza, Great House, and Lee Summit. And so um, all those together, you know, made for great barbecue, remarkable barbecue across Kansas City. And then 20 years ago, Jack decided he wanted to have a private dining facility. And so it was called Fierro's Jack Stack, Fierro Jack Stack Private Dining, um, which was just in Martin City. It held about 120 people. That's where we worked up until a year ago. And uh, that was really, that was the vision for this year, the Fear Relics. Um, we'll take a little tour after we're done putting the shore in, then I'll show you a little bit about how cool this place really is when you think about a thousand people and what we do here. Um, you can go online and look it up, fearrelicskc.com. Um, but so that really was the start of it for Jack, was the smart city private dining and catering. 20 years, they built it from one, you know, literally the Jack driving his car, delivering, you know, what we call express catering, office catering, um, to now we have 24 vans and trucks, and we're at, last year we did just under $6 million in catering. Um, and so that was, and so his vision, you know, this place was an event venue, um, it was kind of run down, it looked like, a, you know, it, it was red carpet, Brass chandeliers, and so it was. It was really it was built in 2000. It's really pretty ugly, to say the least. And uh, so when you see it, you'll see that what a transformation it was. Even the kitchen, our kitchen you know, was the kitchen was bare concrete floors. Um, it was there was literally four inches of grease on everything. It probably hadn't been cleaned in forever. This all this equipment is used equipment. It came with their facility but it was still it was like really bad so we we came in cleaned it all up put about two floors in put new ceilings in put some really nice new equipment in and refurbished all the old equipment and uh then so in september we opened up with a non-barbecue um arm of jackson but called it fiorella we rebranded it and we'll show you the brand when we go on the tour um, so Fiorella is a brand, is a arm of our company that is non-barbecue. So we do we do barbecue all day long, catering in our 25 lands off premise. We'll we'll do barbecue out here for buffets for large groups in our facility, but our menu is all non-barbecue from breakfast to breaks, um, snacks, dinners, lunches. We do we can do a plated dinner. For 900 people here, we can do a uh, cocktail reception for 1300. And so that really it was really Jack's vision. You know, Jack's still alive. Jack comes around this once in a while. He drives one of his many cars, he's a car enthusiast. Um, so he'll drive in and uh, just say hello to everybody. But uh, this really was his dream 25 years ago when catering started. And he started with the road private dining. And so this was just an extension of that. And it really, it became really what he envisioned. And it's really family oriented. We want people to feel like service is the number one thing here. 
but it's not until service. We want everybody to feel like your family when we come here. And when you see the decor, when you see what we turn it into, you'll see that that is the feel. We have a fireplace out front. We have really nice artwork. Um, it just really feels homey when you're having fun. Now we're gonna move on to the short pictures. Hey Chris, we got a question about the greens. About who? About the greens. The greens? Go for it. Okay, so the question is, if it's boiling, do you turn it down and let it simmer for a few hours? Yep. Or yep. Keep, keep it boiling? No, nope, two and a half hours. If you look at it, it's just barely simmering. We just have a few bubbles coming up. We have the flame super low, um, way down to a simmer. So it's just going to bubble there, just going to simmer there for about two, two and a half hours. Great. I'm going to turn this flame on about medium high for the short ribs. We're just going to let this pan get nice and hot. Because, you know, so one of the things I, I try to tell all my cooks and, and you know, and especially apprentices like Angela is that when you're cooking, you cook with all five of your senses. You don't cook with just taste and smell, which a lot of people think that, that those are the only two that deal with cooking. But you'll, you'll hear in a second, you know, just like when you heard the onions crackling, but when we put the meat in this pan, that's why we want to get it nice and hot. Whenever you're, whenever you're sauteing anything or searing something, um, you want to get the pan hot, and then you want to put oil in, and then you want to put your product in. That'll help it from sticking, and it'll get really good caramelization on whatever it is you're cooking. If you put cold oil into a cold pan and put cold product in there, you're never going to get what they refer to as the Maillard reaction, which is the caramelization of the sugars on the outside of what you're cooking. And that can be anything, it doesn't, the meat art reaction is usually referred to when you talk about meats, but it can, re, it's, it refers to vegetables, anything that has sugars in it that can caramelize. So I'm gonna take this nice piece of short rib here. So this is a boneless short rib. This is what it looks like. You have lots of, lots of marbling, lots of intermuscular fat in it, and you have a good amount of connective tissue on both sides. This side is where it was cut away from the bone. And so this connective tissue is on there. You'll see it when we take the other ones out of the oven. After four hours, this will, that will break down. But it's the intermuscular fat and these big chunks of fat that give it this, the amazing flavor that it has. And so I'm just gonna cut this into three or four pieces, probably four pieces, this is a fairly good size. This is probably, I told you two pounds, this is probably about three, three and a half pounds. So a two pound would be about that big you get about four six ounce portions out of two pounds. You lose about 40% of the weight when you're cooking short ribs because of the fat. So we're just gonna cut these down. I'm gonna cut this big kernel of fat here off just because we don't need it. It wouldn't hurt to have it in there, but we don't necessarily need it. And then I'm gonna season all sides. So one of the reasons I turn that on medium high is I don't want it on super high. I don't want it to smoke when I put the oil in there, but I want it to be good and hot. We want to hear a lot of sizzling when we put this meat in. So I'm just using salt and pepper liberally. going to take a little bit of olive oil. This pan is probably good and hot. I'm going to turn it up just a little bit and just enough olive oil to help this start. You see it starting to smoke. This is just going to help the caramelization start. Now you can hear that nice sizzling. And then 
turned it down to me and I'm like, yeah, we're going to hopefully not going to smoke anybody out. I turned the fans off so it wouldn't be quite so loud. But if they're off right now, I think we should be good. It won't not a ton of smoke. So now once we get to this point, we're going to, Angela's going to help me keep an eye on these. Just going to wipe off my cutting board with some sanitizer. And then we're going to cut up the vegetables, the carrots, onions, and celery. And what do we what do we refer to when we talk about carrots, onions, and celery? Mirepoix. Mirepoix. So that is the classic mirepoix is two parts onions, one part carrot, and one part celery. We're going to go a little bit heavier on the carrots because I like I really like roasted carrots in this dish. So we're going to probably go two parts carrots, two parts onions, and one part celery. So you get that really good dark caramelization. That's what you're looking for. And the fat that's in it is rendering now. So that just that teeny bit of olive oil is all you need. If you see that, you see that really nice crust on there. That's what you're looking for. And then we're just we're gonna brown it on all sides. Now, we're going to cut this a little bigger than we did for something else, but this is called a um, oblique cut. So it's got a lot of surface area to get some good caramelization. We're going to caramelize through the cut. Some people call it a roll cut. It's just roll the quarter of a turn and then cut. So you get really good surface area, and they all cut a different size carrot. Here. We're going to cut these, cut this into uh, large dice. And about a half of a stock celery to take to the inside. I've already washed these, and then we're just going to cut this into a large dice as well. I'm going to go grab me a half of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're still in there. So she's going to go grab a pan to put these in. I'm just going to keep burning them. So if you see the green, still just barely simmering, They're looking really good. So once this meat comes out of here, I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit, probably another tablespoon or two of olive oil in the pan. And then we're going to caramelize our vegetables. Just a half thing? No? That's fine. There should be some under the table behind Christian. Any questions? Hey, Chris. Yeah. What's the oven at? 325 degrees.
Hey, Angela, grab a foil one up here. Grab a foil one. Foil. Right here, right here, right here. No, foil half there. Foil half there. Foil half there. No. Yep. Okay. But, uh, production. <laughs> so we're gonna pull these out of here. We have a little bit of oil in there from there, from that. We're gonna put about another tablespoon of olive oil. Again, that nice crackling sound. So most people, I'm just, I'm gonna toss these into the oil real quick, and then I'm gonna forget about it for a minute. You. Vegetables will burn, don't get me wrong, they will, eventually. But you want this to have really good color on these carrots and the vegetables. That's, again, that's the fond you want. So I, I try to push everything for the carrots, have a flat side. The carrots have the most sugar, and so that's what gives a lot of the flavor. So I just push everything down. Now I just want them to like that for about five minutes. So I don't, I don't want to shake it. I don't want to do anything because I want to get that crumb very short. And then you'll see once I flip it for the first time after five minutes, there's lots of good colors. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to put at any point during this. If the stock goes down too low, you put the water in. Okay. Okay. That way it won't burn. And as you're roasting the potatoes, you want to keep turning this meat because it's not covered anymore. Just while you're roasting the potatoes, the rest of the time that it's covered and it keeps moist, but you don't want this meat to dry out too much after you uncover it and then start roasting. We had a question about what to roast it in. Did what to it? roast it in? Yeah. So a if you if you don't have all the choices, a regular nine by twelve baking pan or a La Crusette, if you have the choice. Or a what? La Crusette, yeah. Yeah, La Crusette would be great. I would use cast iron for anything. So if you had if you had a big cast iron, um, um, Dutch oven, that would be perfect. You could do all of this right in the Dutch oven and then cover it and put it in the oven. Um, so yeah, I would love it. That would be the best way is to put it all in the locker set, you know, do all of your sauteing, everything right in there, and then we'll cover it and put it in the oven. But a, but a, you know, a baking dish, a 9 by 13 baking dish is perfectly fine. Any kind, you know, any glass, um, pour in, uh, I don't know what I'm thinking about, but the non breakable ovenable glass where it's perfectly fine. Casserole dish. Yeah. Hot dish. Yeah. <laughs> and you could do this, you know, if you were, if you wanted to walk away from it, if you didn't want to watch it in the oven, if you wanted, you know, you could do this, all of this, and put this straight into the crock pot. Either way, 
either one of these, you could do in the crock pot just like this. You do everything to start just like this, and then put it in the crock pot and walk away. You can go to work, do whatever you want, and you leave it on low for six hours, eight hours, it'll be good. And, uh, look at the colors on the carrot. We have that really good dark, almost what, what some people refer to as burnt, but that is the fawn. That's really what we want. So now I'm going to take our red wine. We're just going to reduce that by about a half. Take my tomato, take the core out quick, and I'm just going to cut, I'm just going to dice this up. Tomato just gives it a little bit of color, but the flavor of the tomato really comes through. So now that wine is getting off all those stuck on this. Tomato, right? One sprig of rosemary, we'll break it in half just for aromatics. It'll cook right in there with it. And then our beef stock. So I'm using, I actually have some veal gummy glaze here. I'm going to use about half this and half water. So this is really rich. really want just enough liquid to cover everything and then and like you saw on the other from the middle and the oven this will all reduce down so that's what it looks like before it goes in the oven just gonna get the foil here Look like when it comes out. So we're gonna take a little tour now, and we'll come back and put it in the sauce and uh, take the potatoes out and everything. Is it better? I don't know. I was just gonna see if it's still comes out. So we're gonna take a little tour, everybody. I'm gonna turn this around, and I'm just gonna walk you through the kitchen. Can everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. So the question so, is, the question is, do you have it covered for the first three hours and then uncovered for the rest? Yep, you have it covered for the first three hours. Then you put the potatoes in and you uncover it. That's Sabrina. She's one of our ops supervisors. Um, so this is our bakery. We have a revent um, deck oven for cooking breads. We've got a 90 gallon stock pot, grills, um, baker's bench, big mixers. This is what we call the bake shop. And we come over here and this is, this is the combi oven. So this is where we do all of our heavy lifting in the kitchen. We can cook um, about 25 pans of beans, 160 chickens, um, just about anything in this oven. And it's really pretty cool because it's all preset. You can load it with a, uh, flash, with a uh, flash drive and uh, you can go from oven to oven. So if when the restaurants, the restaurants also have ovens. I can program it here and they can do the same recipe. This is our blast chiller. So this is where we chill everything super quick. So we have beans in here right now. So we go from, we can do about 30 gallons of beans in from start to finish in two hours. We got some roasted chickens up top there that I'm testing for our new um, Fiorello's carry out menu. This is a Southern Pride smoker. 
So it just got done getting cleaned. It's usually not quite so shiny, but this is where we smoke all of our meats. We can smoke about 110 slabs of ribs or about 45 whole briskets in there. The dish room, most important part of the kitchen. We lost your video, Chris. Uh-oh. Hold on, I'm gonna to talk to my wife real quick. Okay, say hi to Michelle. Yeah. How is everybody doing that's cooking along? I don't know if I can do this, but let's see. Where are you cooking? I think I think I have to cook tomorrow. <laughs> I have to process a little bit. Are we the only ones making it? You might be. Okay, well. We maybe try. Keep it up. So does does the meat have to cook three to four hours? Right? Yes. Okay. So I'm just yeah, I'm thinking my Annie won't wait for me. <laughs> Who won't wait for you? <laughs> Annie won't. My oh, Annie. She won't, she won't wait for that, that's too long to wait for supper. <laughs> I have to go slower anyway than you. <laughs> you can have it for breakfast. So this, right. is, this is one of our ballrooms. This mm. is actually, we set up the ballroom. This is our sales office. This is our call center now because our sales office is pretty small and they couldn't be six feet apart. So now they're a ballroom apart. <laughs> now we're walking out into the lobby. So the lights are off, but you'll be able to see once we get to the main part of the lobby. Um, so our, that was one, that was one fifth of the ballroom. I'm going to go in here, turn on the lights. So that's another part of the ballroom. So every one of these salons, the air walls open up into the 1,000 person ballroom. So this piece of art was done by a local artist. This is actually all wood. This is what we call the wheat wall. So this is the first thing you see when you walk in is this really big wall of, of carved wood and reclaimed wood. And then you have our big hearth fireplace. And the big beams up top, the big wagon wheel lights. There's one of our vans out front. And we have parking for 500 people. The beams come outside as well. It's a beautiful day here in Kansas City. Have you and done yet, all your deliveries, Chris, for tonight? Oh, uh, well, all the restaurants are still open and going till nine o'clock. But I mean, you're done, you're done delivering by now or not? Delivering. To the restaurants. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, we do our last, we do our last delivery about 3.30 in the afternoon. Okay. This, so this is our corporate office. This is Cheryl. So this is what we refer to as team support. This is where all of our corporate people have offices. And then we're right around to the back again. So we'll take a walk outside and I'll show you this. This is our corral where we have all the vans. So all of our vans and trucks, or most of them are out right now. Like I said, delivering um, restaurant food and or, um, we actually just got into 65 grocery stores in Kansas City as well. As soon as this the COVID happened, we decided we wanted to um, expand and get some new avenues of revenue. So we got our products from our USDA facility that's about an hour away from here into uh, 60 local grocery stores. So Chris, some people might also want to know how they can get Jack Stack Barbecue at home. Yep, any day. You can um, go to jackstackbarbecue.com and we ship nationwide. Cool. 
and we're right back to where we started. There's our greens. All right, Tony is asking Jack Stack versus Joe's. Yeah, we're way better. <laughs> <laughs> What's Joe's? Kansas City Joe's. It used to be called Oklahoma Joe's. They're they're a very good company, but they you know are they're they're more of the stand in line and get your food and then go away. It's a it's a walk up. Um, what do you call it? It's just a it's a walk up place where you, it's a counter. It's counter service only. They actually their their um, first one is right around the corner from our house and it's in a it's in a gas station so it's really kind of a cool place and they do they've won a lot of awards for their barbecue but um it's, it's never between full service our restaurants are 100 full service our restaurants if you walk in any one of our restaurants it would be very reminiscent of what you would see in the lobby out a little more rustic but very much the same feel as our lobby with the, with the wood fireplaces Hey, we can need one of our meal menus. It's one of the white dishes. Uh, medium size. So here's our, we're going to make this sauce here really quick. We're going to, we're running over. I hope everybody doesn't have any place to be. <laughs> just you, just you. You want to go home? <laughs> no, never. No. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm just going to, I'm going to, just plate it up real quick. I'm going to show you how to make a, make the sauce really quick because this sauce, even, you know, I use veal stock or veal demi glaze, which is reduction of veal. Um, so I'm going to show you how poor tender this is. So you can slice it, but really it should just fall apart like that. So it, it should be pork tender all to the point where it just falls apart. I'm just going to give it a couple, couple, yeah, a couple of quick slices and just put it in the, pan here. Troy, is yours in the oven? Yep. It's in the oven. Did, you get it in, did you get it in the oven, Troy? You got it in the oven. Sweet. You want, you need a job? <laughs> <laughs> I had some of it prepped already. <laughs> okay, so. This is my favorite piece right here with all the connected tissue and fat. It's probably a lot of people's least favorite, but I love it because it's got all that fat. So I'm just gonna do that. I'm gonna take the roasted potatoes out. The roasted potatoes, these could go for about another 15, 20 minutes, but for the sake of television. <laughs> and I think Michelle missed the new link, so I'm probably not gonna best graces with my wife right now all right i'm, so I'm recording coming. i'm recording think, you Chris, so if anybody wants it they can get it just let me know if anybody wants me to send you the link okay so now we're going to take this we're going to go over to our you have a blender at home if you have a food processor processor either one will work So, we have another one. Oh, I see there's one right there. I don't know. I don't think I've ever used this one. <laughs> well, I'm going to figure it out real quick here. That power should probably work then. So to make this sauce super easy, we'll figure out how to work the blender. Just take it and blend it up. If I, um, if you want, you can add a couple tablespoons of butter, which will make it really soft and silky. And 
think. Probably needs a clear down there. Yeah, probably here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do anything. Yeah, mess. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. Okay, so what do you have in here? Probably one of those numbers. The lid is open. Ah. There we go. <laughs> Look at that. Man, that thing's quiet. <laughs> yeah, that is really quiet. Whatever you have one, this one's super quiet. So, and that's really making the sauce. You just want to blend all those vegetables up. And you have a pour it on or spit on. You have a really nice thick sauce with those vegetables in there. And we're just gonna taste it real quick and season it if we need. Yeah, doesn't even need to unseason. So, yeah. Voila. Voila. When the green yeah. the greens are done, we can take the greens out of here. And the greens actually it's better if you want to present it, that's great. But it's actually better as a soup than it is as a side like that. A bowl and a spoon is perfect for this. <laughs> Can I ask a question about the greens? Go ahead. So you, um, I didn't hear what you were saying about the ham hock. I know you didn't add one but you would just put that in after the beer and just let it finish cooking with the greens or i mean so raw we're talking about raw ham hock right so. yep uh, a smoked a smoked ham hock um traditionally you know people would put a a, a smoked pig's foot in there pig's feet will give it lots of jelly um it will it'll make it almost thick if you were to chill it it would become a gelatin in the pan that you chilled it in because uh, pig's feet have so much gelatin in there, in the um, uh, collagen in their feet and in the uh, joints. So yeah, that the ham hock, the smoked ham hock can just go in right when you start the green, right when I put that piece of ham in there and you just let it cook the whole time. And actually the ham hock will fall apart as it cooks. Um, you can just pull the bones out and then you have the ham that's surrounding it will just fall off and become super tender. Mm -hmm. okay. I haven't seen pig's feet since I left my family farm in Wisconsin years ago. <laughs> yeah. We butchered all our own, we raised our own, we raised pork for Jones Dairy Farm and we did all our own butchering and I love pig's feet, but I you don't see them at our Puget, consumer co-op i'll just tell you no yeah it's yeah you have to you have to go to a real butcher we have we have one or two here in kansas city we have a mexican butcher bickle myers that uh does the whole hog so you can get them there but other than that there's maybe one or two places in kansas city where you can get them Chris, i want to raise pigs again <laughs> Yes, I want to raise pigs again, Mom. Okay. <laughs> well, Chris, we'll be looking. We'll be looking forward to you coming out to Seattle and um, taking Jack Stack on tour. And I, I imagine next time you're in Minnesota, there's people that want you to cook for them there too. <laughs> yep. And we're, you know, we're looking to do. We're looking to do in Kansas City with this. I brought this up to our corporate team and to my senior team. And the president Ricky Perez, and you know we've all we've started. I've started talking with our marketing people about doing something, maybe referred to as the Peloton of cooking in Kansas City, where we um, where we would sell a box of food. People would come here, pick it up cold um, in a in a refrigerated box, and take it home. And then they could go online at night um, and watch me or myself and maybe another chef in Kansas City collaborate on some menus and do different things once or twice a week. <clears throat> cool. 
eso? Anybody have any other questions for Chris? Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. That was fun. What? What? Kara, thank you for bringing this to us. Thank you, you Kara. We'll get together Thanks. again. Next menu. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kara, if you want to send me the link to that so Michelle can watch it if she wants to. Yep. Yep, I'll send it out to everybody I know that's on the call. There's a couple of people whose addresses I'm not sure I have, so you guys can forward them out to each other. Awesome. Thank you, guys. All yeah, right. So love you. Great evening. Enjoy, enjoy your dinner. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.